This morning we're going to conclude our study in the book of Ezra by turning to the eighth chapter of the book of Nehemiah. The title of our message this morning is Reading, Receiving, and Rejoicing in the Word. When I was about seven years old, I had to learn the first psalm for my Sunday school class. And it's stuck with me for these last 60 years. And I'd like you to listen to just the first three verses. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. For his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he doth meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The writer of this song says that if we're going to be fruitful trees in God's garden, trees that produce spiritual fruit, what we would call the fruit of the Spirit, we need to be planted next to and be nourished by the water which is the word of God. Nourishing comes, we're told, by meditating, by thinking, chewing over, and understanding the scriptures. Many years ago, we had a pre-teenage family member stay with us for about a week, and he was an excessively big boy. He was probably three or four times heavier than the average boy his age. The first night we sat down for dinner for steak and fettuccine alfredo and green beans. And I kid you not, Kevin ate his piece of steak as large as my hand in only three bites. I nearly gagged watching him wolf down this piece of meat. He finished off his plate of food before we'd even put our napkins on our lap and picked up our forks. And then he was ready for seconds. When his grandmother picked him up at the end of the week, I suggested she might need to talk to his doctor about his eating habits. And she confided that Kevin had been diagnosed as malnourished, despite eating enough every day for an entire family. He was malnourished because he ate his food in such big bites that his body couldn't digest it and assimilate the nutrients from the food. Years ago, I read a story of a village in India affected by a severe drought. The drought was so severe that the people were eating dirt. They might mix some spices with it to make it more appealing. And it did fill their stomachs, and some of the people were even getting fat. But the villagers were dying despite having full bellies. You see, there wasn't any nutritional value in the dirt. And the dirt didn't always pass through their bodies like food would. In Psalm 1, you may have noted the word meditate. In his law doth he meditate day and night. Now this word meditate is what I call a farm word. It describes a cow chewing its cud. A cow has a four-part stomach. When a cow chews grass, the grass is mashed by the teeth and begins breaking down in the cow's saliva. The cow swallows the grass and it passes into the first portion of the stomach. But the grass is so fibrous that the cow's stomach can't digest it all. So the cow vomits the grass back up into its mouth and starts the process of chewing again. The cow continues this process until the grass is so mashed that the grass passes through each stomach chamber and into the gut. This process of chewing and swallowing and bringing it back up and starting all over again is called chewing the cud. The psalmist uses this word for meditate. For a person to be fruitful in his spiritual life, he needs to chew on the cud of the law of God day and night. He needs to read the word, question it, think about it, swallow it, and then start the process all over again until the scripture is fully comprehended and only then can it be put into practice. As your pastor, 
once a week, I cook up what I believe is a delicious, nutritious meal from the milk and the meat of God's word, and then I serve it to you. But I can't make you open your mouth or chew or swallow. Now, I could shovel it down your throat, but if you don't chew on it to understand it, you will never be able to live it. So turn, if you haven't already, to Nehemiah chapter number 8. I'm going to read the entire chapter as we conclude the book of Ezra. We're going to look here at an event recorded about Ezra that I think is very significant. And I'd have you recall that Ezra and Nehemiah are included together as one book in the Hebrew Scriptures. Follow along, Nehemiah chapter number 8. We'll start with verse number 1. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Verse number four. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose. And beside him at his right hand stood Matahiah, Shema, Aniah, Urijah, Hilkiah, and Masiah, and at his left hand, Pediah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshalem. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodijah, Messiah, Kelita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. Verse 9. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and send portions and rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. Verse 13. Now on the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people, with the priests and Levites, were gathered to Ezra, the scribe, in order to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, branches of olive trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees to make booths as it is written. 
Then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house or in their courtyards or the courts of the house of God and in the open square of the water gate and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole congregation of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under their booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so, and there was very great gladness. Also day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a sacred assembly, according to the prescribed manner. Now this chapter begins with the remnant gathering together as one man to call Ezra to read the Bible to them. Ezra had arrived in Jerusalem some 13 years earlier, having prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. We find that in Ezra chapter 7 verse number 10. The people had just finished building the walls around Jerusalem and their overwhelming desire was to hear the word of God. Can you imagine that? They've just finished this amazing project and the first thing they want to do is hear the scriptures read. I have a pastor friend who lost nearly half of his congregation when he was appointed. And he insisted that the scriptures be read on Sunday morning in a way so that the whole Bible is read through every five years. People left the church complaining that there was too much of God's word. If the Bible is as it claims and as we assert, the very words of God breathed out to mankind. Explain to me how you can have too much of God speaking. Hunger for the word of God reflects a hunger for the God of the word. Ezra brought from the temple those first five books of the Bible, what we call the Pentateuch, or the books of Moses. Since most people in the ancient world couldn't read, and of course the printing press didn't exist yet, there was usually only one or a few copies of the Bible available. Most people don't know this, but Deuteronomy chapter 31 verses 10 through 12 required that the people would gather together every seven years and listen as the books of the law were read to them. Verse number three says that all the remnant met at the water gate and the water gate was located at the southeast corner of the old city of Jerusalem. This gate was at the Gihon Spring in the Kidron Valley. It's interesting that the people didn't gather at the temple. The law, you see, was greater than the temple. They didn't meet before the altar where they performed their acts of sacrificial worship. They met at the water gate. They met there to hear the scriptures read to them. Recall that Psalm 1 speaks of God's people being like trees planted by rivers of water. And God's word is described for us by Jesus in John 15, 3, and by Paul in Ephesians 5, 26, as being like water for the purpose of washing. We also find this was the first day of the seventh month. It's what we would call New Year's Day. And those who could hear with understanding, as well as the men and the women assembled. God intended for the law to be read and understood and known and obeyed by all of his people. But here, babies and very young children were excluded. You had to be able to understand the scripture when it was read in order to attend this meeting. There's at least one very good reason for that. Verse number three says that the reading lasted between six to nine hours from sunrise and it continued until midday. Now that's a long time even for adults. <laughs> 
So how old do you have to be to understand? It's different for every child. In my first pastorate, I was preaching one extremely hot Sunday night, and the congregation was, I could tell, getting dozy in the 100-plus degree breezeless room. And I rhetorically asked in the middle of my sermon, does anyone even care? And a tiny little voice from a three- or four-year-old boy who was laying on the floor in the back of the room, coloring in a book, responded, and his tiny little voice said, I care, Uncle Richard. Now, no one in that room expected that little boy to be paying attention, but he was. Do you know that the Bible equates mindless acceptance of something as a sign of paganism? It does. Isaiah 44, verses 18 through 20, and Hosea chapter 4, verse number 6 if you just accept things that are said to you, you're no different than a pagan. Here in the book of Nehemiah, verses 2, 3, 7, 8, 9, 12, and 13, all make the point of the importance of understanding. God calls us to reason together with him. And you can't reason if you don't understand. If you just accept something, you can't reason. You can't think about. You can't discuss it. You can't consider it. Because understanding is more than simply hearing and obeying. As a preacher, I need to understand the text of Scripture before I can teach it. And you need to understand God's word before you can heartily obey it. Blind obedience to God or to anyone or anything else doesn't come from the heart or from the mind. Blind obedience is the result of ignorance, fear, manipulation, or a desire to gain someone's favor. Obedience without understanding is not loving the one who who's spoken to you. Ezra and 13 other unidentified men, whose titles and names were really not important as the event was, stood atop a high platform or a tower next to the gate. Now this raised platform was so that the voice of the reader could be heard at greater distances and also, I think, to demonstrate the lifting up of God's word above everything else. When you participate in a worship service, I'd have you to pay attention to the decor of the room where you're gathered. The layout of the building, the colors used, the furniture, they all have meaning, whether we pay attention to it or not. For example, Notice what stands at the center of attention on the platform as you are in the audience. Is it a communion table, a cross, a railing to keep people away, maybe a television screen, a drum set, or a statue of Mary? It could be the preacher's photograph or the name of the congregation. Could it be the pulpit from where the scripture is read and preached? You see, things are placed front and center for a reason, not just practical reasons, because they speak subconsciously to us. Whatever is front and center is meant to be the center and focus of your attention. When Ezra opened the scroll of the scripture, the tens of thousands of the remnant were told, stood up. There's no indication that they were asked or even told to stand. They did it out of respect for the written voice of God. They stood in honor of God's word, which is a beautiful tradition common in Reformed congregations. If you've been watching and listening for very long, I grew up in a traditional conservative Pentecostal assembly. And as I grew older and more familiar with the Bible, I noted a number of things that were odd to me. Often at some point in the order of service, someone would stand and give a message in tongues. 
and every head would bow, every eye would close. Many people would even stand. The congregation would be still as we listened to God's, what we were told, fresh, contemporary, innovative, living message directly from heaven's gate at that very moment in time to God's people. And yet when it came time for the pastor to read from the Bible, people would shift in their seats or they'd get up to use the restroom or whisper, and they seemed to pay little attention. You see, the reading of the Bible was God's old, crusty, familiar word. The message in tongues was God speaking directly to us. The Bible was the preacher just reading to us. And yet, Listen to what Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 says. For the word of God, he's speaking about the Bible. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The author there says that the Bible, the ancient written word of God, specifically, he's writing of the Old Testament, is living and is powerful. So why is it that we show more respect to the American flag or a president or an elderly family member than we do to the breathed out voice of God that in the beginning created all things from nothing? At Sinai, his voice shook the mountain, causing terror among the Jewish people. When the temple mob arrived on the Mount of Olives to arrest Jesus on the Passover night, the Apostle John alone in the Gospel notes something of great interest. In John chapter 18, verses 4 through 6, we read that Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, because they'd come to arrest him. It was dark. They couldn't identify which one was Jesus among the disciples. Jesus said to them, whom are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Then when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. If you have the New King James Version, you'll notice that in Jesus' answer of whom the mob was seeking, the word he is in italics. That means that the translators added the word he to help us understand what is being relayed to us. So when the mob said they were there to find Jesus, Jesus literally said, I am. And the whole lot of them fell to the ground. John made a great effort here in his gospel to record a series of I am statements given by Jesus. Each of these identifies Jesus as Jehovah of the Old Testament. So I hope that you recognize that Jesus there in the garden, when he was ready to be arrested, identified himself as the I am, as Jehovah, as Yahweh, as the eternal God who makes and keeps his covenant promises. And the mob was unable physically to stand in the presence of Almighty God. And yet, today, you and I hear his living word read to us, and we can't pay attention because we're eager to get to the exciting right now voice of a modern prophet, apostle, or evangelist. I ask you to fix it forever in your mind. The Bible is not a man speaking, but it's God speaking. As Martin Luther admonished, let the man who would hear God speak read Holy Scriptures.
Here in Nehemiah, verse number six, we read that Ezra blessed or praised the Lord. We know that when God or a person blesses or praises us, it means that they are sharing some kind of favor upon us. But what does it mean for us to bless the Lord? Augustine of Hippo explained it, I think, very simply, that blessing or praising the Lord is simply returning his own image back upon him. It's giving to him the honor that is due his name. It's to describe his worthy works and his worthy character. Praise isn't singing a song, but praise is telling God and those around us of the greatness of God. What exactly did Ezra say that caused the people to shout in Aramaic, Amen, Amen? Amen simply means make it so, or what you've said is true. Ezra read the Bible, and it elicited face-to-the-ground worship by God's people. You know, I get irritated by idiots today who accuse people like you and me of being idolaters. They claim that we are Bible worshipers rather than God worshipers. They denounce us who believe in sola scriptura, that the Bible alone is the inspired, inerrant, authoritative revelation of God given for our faith and our practice. The remnant, however, they didn't worship the book, and neither do we. The remnant worshiped the God who revealed himself, the God who spoke to them in the book. 1 Timothy 4.13, Paul wrote, Until I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. From what was Timothy supposed to read, exhort, and teach doctrine? It wasn't the newspaper. It wasn't some magazine. It wasn't something that someone in the congregation had written. It was the Bible. Until Paul arrived... Timothy and the church was to give attention to the reading of Scripture, to the exhortation or the encouragement from Scripture, and to the doctrine of Scripture. And yet, most congregations spend more time hearing their own voices sing than hearing the voice of God in His Word. Ezra read the Scripture. Verse number 8 says, He read it distinctly. And the men whose names we know, but we know nothing about who they were or what they did, they read the word of God distinctly. Hebrew was virtually a dead language. Remember, the people knew the language of Babylon and Persia, the language that we call Aramaic. In fact, in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 24, we can read there that half of the children didn't even speak Aramaic at this point. They were speaking the language common in Ashdod, a Canaanite city on the coastline. Ezra read the Bible, and the Levites who were scattered around the assembly then took and gave the sense so the people could understand. Ezra read in Hebrew the scripture because it was written there, but the Levites scattered around the assembly, then explained what was being read and put it in a language understandable to the congregation. Levites, recall, were tasked by God in the law to teach the Bible. Deuteronomy 33.10 and Malachi 2.7, for example. So Ezra would read a portion of the book of, let's say, Leviticus in Hebrew, the Levites would then put it into a language that the people could understand, answer questions, and explain what had been read. This process is what today we call expository preaching. The word exposit simply means to explain something clearly. The Bible wasn't merely being proclaimed as an evangelist does. It was being explained not just proclaimed, but explained. 
It's the difference between preaching and teaching. God's word must be understood if we're going to obey it from the heart. I was appointed as pastor of a congregation whose pastor died after some 20 years in that pulpit. After a few months, one of the leading men told me how much he appreciated my preaching. He said, you don't tell us from the Bible what we did wrong all week. You tell us from the Bible what we're supposed to do and why we're supposed to do it. I've always said to my congregations that you will not last long in this church without bringing your Bible. And I can't tell you how many times husbands or wives have commented to me that they'd never seen their spouse with a Bible until they started attending our services. Whether it's in the time that we proclaim and explain the Word of God corporately, or it's in the time that you privately and individually read and study the Bible, I ask you, what is your response to God's Word? After you read the scriptures, or after you've heard it exposited, how do you respond? How do you reply? I can tell you the reaction of most people on Sunday morning. As soon as the Bible is closed by the preacher, so closes the minds and the hearts of the congregation. When we leave worship on Sunday morning, in our family, there's discussion on the drive home or over dinner. We talk about what we learned from the sermon or how God's word touched us or maybe even slapped us or how grateful we are to have a pastor who is faithful in preparing and presenting the word of God. Now I'll have you pay a special attention to the response of God's people in verse number nine of Nehemiah when they heard and understood the word exposited to them. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. The people, hearing the word read and then exposited so that they could understand it, made them mourn. Now that they understood the scripture, they knew how disobedient they had been. They knew the disobedience of their ancestors and how it brought suffering and how their own disobedience would bring suffering. Romans 3.20 says that from the law is a knowledge of sin. You won't know what God says is right or wrong, good or evil, unless you know his word. Now, the Bible can't save you or forgive you or make you godly or get you to heaven. But it does, as Paul wrote, make us wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Because all scripture is given by inspiration or breathing out of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's 2 Timothy 3, verses 15 through 17. And then Paul commanded Timothy to preach the word. So rather than weep, the reading and the comprehension of God's word was a time to celebrate a holy day, a day for feasting, rather than for fasting. And as we've seen in the book of Ezra, and now again here in Nehemiah, fasting was a symbol of sorrow among the Jewish people. This day of reading and understanding the word of God, this day was about God's character and God's works, not about the people's failures and losses. Someone has said, it's as wrong to mourn when God has forgiven us as it is to rejoice when sin has conquered us. 
Remember, this happened on the first day of the seventh month, or what we would call New Year's Day. Now, the tenth day of the month was the Day of Atonement, when the nation's sins were laid upon a sacrifice, and God forgave the nation. The Day of Atonement was given in Scripture as a time to rejoice because their sins were forgiven by the merciful, gracious, good God. And everyone on the Day of Atonement was to celebrate God's goodness. And on this particular day of the reading and understanding of God's word, the people were to again rejoice. Why? Verse 10, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. The source of spiritual strength isn't some encounter with miracles or a prophet or the Holy Spirit, but joy in the Lord is the source of our strength. Their joy was because they understood God's word. And when we understand God's word, we will understand God better. And when we understand God better and understand his word better, we will be better able to serve him through obedience. Listen, Psalm 1 verse 2, his delight, the one who nourishes himself by chewing on the word of God, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Psalm 19 verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Psalm 119, verse 111. Your testimonies I've taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Psalm 119, verse 162. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your work was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord of hosts. 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. The world's joy is partying with sex, drugs, and drink. Just look at our New Year's celebrations. The world's joy leads to a miserable hangover the next day and the dread of one, what one did the night before. It's a joy that ends up causing vomiting and regret and forgetfulness. While God's word gives us strength and joy amid our trials, and it's a joy that is lasting, and it fills our lives with wows rather than woes. The following day, Ezra held a Bible study for Ezra's leaders, we read. And the study revealed something shocking to the people in that group. Too often we appreciate the gift and the neglect the giver. And the Feast of Tabernacles was supposed to correct that error. On the 15th day of the first month was the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles or we would say today, tents. You find this in Leviticus 23, verses 34 through 43. This feast was a reminder of God's faithful provision for Israel during those 40 years where they wandered through the wilderness. It was also a celebration for that particular year's harvest that God provided. The Feast of Tabernacles was a week-long celebration where the people were to rest, they were to offer thank offerings to God, feast, and they were to build and live in temporary shelters or tents, tabernacles or booths. The nation of Israel had been celebrating this feast from the time God gave it to Moses. It was held during the time of Kings Solomon and Hezekiah and Josiah, even Ezra celebrated this, we find in Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. But we read here in the text of Nehemiah that the remnant discovered something new, something that they didn't understand before Ezra had been expositing God's word to them. 
what was new that hadn't been done before was the manner in which the feast was supposed to be held. It was to be celebrated with joy. Since the time of Joshua, mentioned here in verse number 17, Israel had kept the feast out of a blind obedience to the law of Moses. But now the remnant understood the biblical reasons for their biblical traditions and God's commands. They understood the word for the first time in their lives, possibly. They understood the Bible, reading the word, receiving the word as it was exposited, created within them the ability to rejoice in the word. For seven days of the feast, Ezra read the Bible while the Levites exposited just as they had done at the water gate earlier in the month. Very quickly, I'll have you jump ahead in the book of Nehemiah to chapter number 9. So after the Feast of Tabernacles, where the people, when they understood the word, they mourned at their sin and the loss that they had suffered because of their sin. And they're told, don't mourn. This is a time to rejoice. You understand the word of God. Now that you understand the word, you understand God better and you can obey him better from the heart. They celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles with feasting and joy. But after the Feast of Tabernacles, we read that the people fasted and were told why. Follow along as I read Nehemiah chapter 9, starting with verse number 1. Now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Then those of Israel's lineage separated themselves from all foreigners and they stood and they confessed their sins and the iniquities all of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one fourth of the day. And for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. You see, they didn't fast to make themselves humble. They didn't fast to get grace or God's forgiveness or to understand his direction and the will that he had for their lives. They didn't fast to get blessing or favor or answered prayer. They fasted as a symbol of their sorrow for their sin, their national sin, the sin that they had committed as well as their ancestors. And as they fasted, every single person stood one-fourth of the day while scripture was read. And for the next one-fourth of the day, as they stood, they confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors to God. Let me ask a serious question for you, just to ponder in your own mind. Remember, believers in God, people of the word, need to be people who think and not just accept things blindly because the guy in the pulpit or the guy on the TV said it. Why do people want to pick up the act of fasting out of this passage and yet ignore the rest of the passage? They'll use this passage on fasting as a prescription, then ignore the fact that the people stood for three or four hours reading the scripture and three or four hours they stood confessing their sins. So why would we pick out the fasting and leave the rest? I'll only say this. If you're going to use these passages as a reason for fasting, then do it all the way. Don't pick part of it and ignore the rest. And look at the context and look at the reason for the fasting. I know people that fast today and they do it so they can clear their minds and hear God. That is not biblical. They fast so that God will feel sorry for them and answer their prayers. That's not biblical. Their confession was a realization of their sinfulness and the sinfulness of their entire nation. And they mourned over it. And they mourned rather than ate. 
They confess to their sins, saying the very same thing about their thoughts and their words and their deeds and their motives and their intentions as God said about those. And the more they saw their sinfulness as they understood the word, the more they mourned. The final chapters of Nehemiah, I think, are very informative. Chapter 8 records Israel's mourning over their sin as they understood the word. And then they're told to rejoice instead because of who God was rather than mourn over their sin. Chapters 9 and 10 describe God's great faithfulness and Israel recommitting herself to God. And then chapters 11, 12, and 13 give us a list of the families living in Jerusalem, a list of the priestly families, and a celebration commemorating the completion of Jerusalem's wall. But there's also the correction of four areas of national sin, including the same sin that ended in the book of Ezra. The people were intermarrying with pagans, and it was corrupting the very heart of Israel. I pray that this look at what happens with Ezra and Nehemiah and the remnant as they were reading and receiving and rejoicing in the word of God has been an encouragement to you to do the very same thing.